Good morning, everybody. It's me again, uh, coming to you live from uh, uh, Studio D, which is my fourth bedroom in my house uh, during the 30 something day of, uh, I say 30 something uh, day of the COVID lockdown. Anyway, so I've been coming uh, at you live every day now for the last uh, two and a half, three weeks, and I'm having a blast. Today, I'm going to be talking about compressors. Now, yesterday, uh, yesterday we talked about uh, audio compressors, and uh, I had so much fun that I'm going to talk about it some more. I'm just going to, going to talk about a few more of my uh, go-to compressors, how I set them up, uh, and maybe it'll help you. I don't know. Um, I'll be taking questions toward the end, and uh, so if there's if there's anything that uh, maybe I didn't explain well enough, or you want to hear more of. Let me know, and I'll uh, I'll take some questions at the end. Hey, Mark, good to see you this morning, man. Hope you've had breakfast already. Wish this was full of coffee, but it's not. I've already finished one cup. I'm going to reward myself and have another cup of coffee a little later. So anyway, okay, so let's go ahead and jump on in. Uh, real quick, I wanted to say that uh, if you don't know who I am, Kevin Ward, I'm the founder of Mix Coach. I'm a mixing engineer. I'm a technical director, production director. I don't know what you want to call it, uh, at a church here in Anaheim, California. I live in your Belinda and I uh, moved out here about uh, three and a half years ago, almost four years ago. And I've been having a blast learning a lot of new stuff. I'm mixing. I am uh, video directing. I'm uh, leading a bunch of uh, rock star volunteers. Uh, and we're figuring out production as we go. So, uh, that's a little bit about me. And today, like I said, we mentioned yesterday, we talked about a few compressors uh, that I go to and that I love to mix with. And, you know, compression is one of those things where it's confusing. It is confusing when people ask me a compressor. You know, I've tried to come up with a, a nice, tidy um, definition of what a compressor is, because if you're not in the audio world, you don't necessarily you don't understand it. You think it's something that you, uh, you know, spray paint with or, or jackhammer with or something like that. You use a compressor for that, right? It's uh, even when you Google it, that's what's come. That's what comes up. So it's a little bit of a nerdy term. Uh, I'm talking nerdy to you now, right? Uh, it's a little bit nerdy, I guess. But what a compressor is, in a nutshell, is a device that you can run audio through that will. Um, decrease the dynamic range. And by dy dynamic range, I mean it uh, it squeezes or compresses the difference between the loudest uh, thing you can sing in and the lowest thing you can sing in, and it squeezes them together, it compresses them. And then what you do with that pancake or that compressed uh, signal is you raise the signal of it, okay? That's kind of like the basic use of a compressor. Back in the day when, you know, radio broadcasts and TV, live TV broadcast and, um, and you know, live records and stuff. You had to have a way to contain uh, loud things that would have loud transient things or loud people singing in the mics because back in the day, you know, they recorded live to tape and uh, or, or even, even further back, live to vinyl disc. And those vinyl discs had definite physical limitations in the fact that if you hit, if something was too loud, it would skip and ruin the disc, not only ruin the take, but ruin the disc that, you know, they had to pay for. Yes, we used to have to buy things to put uh, recordings on, not just hard drives. So um, so that's what compressors do. That they're, They were designed to limit dynamic range of things so that you could actually get them louder or make them sit in a mix a little better. Um, the second way people use compressors is for, you know, character. They give character. They use the uh, settings of a compressor to give things more uh, aggression or more um, um, more attack, more sustain. Uh, you can do all this stuff with a compressor. But yesterday, if you haven't seen it, go and check it out. Um, I'll try to paste a link somewhere in here. Um, we talked about it. We talked about, um, you know, bass players uh, that maybe are not consistent playing the note, you know, and maybe they play a note louder than softer. And, and then they wonder why you're, they're not louder in the mix. And it's because we as mixers have to mix um, their loudest note 
as as the mix. And then every other note falls under that and it's not loud enough. So when they play the loud note, it's loud enough, but the, everything else is not, you know, it is not loud enough. So what you do is you compress it so you can pull the whole thing up. The best solution though is just to get people to play it correctly, which you know that takes a little bit of coaxing and and please don't be that <clears throat> that IT guy that you see on Saturday Night Live that's just like rolls his eyes at everybody. Um, that's not what we should do, right? We should be teaching people how to get how to help us get our best sound, right? So um, so anyway, uh, yesterday we talked about all that stuff in depth. Today, what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is I'd like to go through just a few more, uh, three in particular, of not my, <clears throat> they're not my favorite compressors. They're, they're, I have a lot of favorite compressors. Um, so, um, so let's just break it down and I'll show you uh, kind of <clears throat> the run through of, of how I use them. Um, and believe me, uh, just a little side note here. I don't know everything about compressors. If I did, I would probably be designing them or something ridiculous like that. I use compressors though, and I feel like I use them pretty well. Um, you can hear them if I want you to hear them. You don't hear them if I don't want you to hear them. Uh, and they contain dynamic range like they're supposed to. And sometimes I'll put character into a, a track with a compressor. So um, I don't know everything about it, but I feel like I know enough to show you maybe what I do and maybe you can use it. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, <clears throat> anybody have a clue what my favorite compressor is? I'm just, just curious. I know I said I'd be taking, taking questions later on, but if you, um, I'm going to reveal it. One of my favorite compressors, one of my go-to compressors that I pretty much use on every track. And this has been, it's an emulation of a hardware compressor. Um, or actually a channel strip, and I use it pretty much in every mix that I do. And I'm going to reveal it in three, two, one. The SSL E-Channel. Okay, this is uh, this compressor. I'm just going to walk through it real quick. This is the Waves SSL E-Channel. And basically, this is an emulation of a channel out of an SSL. Now, an SSL it doesn't have the line down the middle here. At least the E-Channel does. It's all vertical. So... It's kind of out of order. It makes it makes sense when you look at it this way, but um, this is what I use a lot. And I and I have a special preset that I created that I got from I don't know. I think maybe um, I read an article with Chris Lord Algae, who is a famous mixer and one of my favorite mixers. He uses compressors to give his mixes a lot of attitude, a lot of attitude, and I've always loved that. And as a matter of fact. Um, back in the day, a little side story back in the day when, uh, I first moved to Nashville, I think it was 90, I moved to Nashville in 96 and this would have been about 97 or 98. Uh, Chris Lord Algae was mixing a lot of country stuff. He was mixing for Faith Hill, Jody Messina, some of the stuff. I mean, you could just tell when his stuff came on the radio because it had this growl, this attitude that was just like, ah, oh, I want to mix like that. And uh, when you hear his mix and you mix your mix, it, it, you know, it made me mad. And I was like, just twist the knobs. And, and I would hear stories about how fast he was at mixing. And I was like, I'm going to email him. I'm going to try to find his email on the on this new internet thing that we're using in 97, 98. So I looked him up and I found his email address. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try this uh, thing. And I emailed him and I said, hey, Chris, um, I love your mixes. I know you're spending a lot of time in Nashville. I would love to buy you lunch one day. He never took me up on it. Maybe he still will. Uh, I would love to buy your lunch one day. Um, can you answer two specific questions for me? And 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 uh, and he did. He wrote me back. I was like, oh. Uh, so the questions I had was, how do you compress your kick and snare? Easy answer. And how do you compress your two bus or your master bus, the, the last fader before the world hears it, right? Um, and he wrote me back and he was like, okay, DBX 160X. All, and this, uh, this is almost verbatim. I remembered it. DBX 160X, all the buttons out, all the everything at zero, two to one ratio. Um, crank the input until you get 10 dB of gain reduction. 
And I was like, how does he know how loud my snare is? Then I figured out what he was doing later. I'll cover that. We'll cover that later. But anyway, he uses these. Uh, remember yesterday we talked about the DBX 160X or the DBX 160, which was the earlier model of that. The 160X was a horizontal rack, one rack space compressor with LEDs on it. Uh, modern, but it really does sound good. Anyway, I tried it, and you know what? It sounded it sounded a lot like his kick and snare. It had that that uh, so. And and I read a thing a little later with him. He said, if you want to crank it, you got to spank it. And that's what he calls, you know, compressing something really hard is spanking it with a compressor. So I used, uh, I, I've been using this. So the thing I got out of that was a low, uh, a low uh, ratio. You remember yesterday we talked about compression ratios and how, and the, how you're, you've got the intern that's actually working the knobs, right? And you tell your intern, hey, don't let it get above this level. And if it gets above this level, turn it down. And the ratio is how much he turns it down or what the ratio is. Like for every 2 dB that's coming above the threshold, he turns it down to 1 dB. Um, so that's the ratio. So what I found out from CLA or Chris Lord Algae was he compresses most everything. He and his brother both, Tom Lord Algae, they compress everything at a really low ratio but a really high threshold. So they compress everything, but at a low ratio. That's how they get that attitude. This compressor here is a, a VCA compressor, just like the DBX 160 or the 160 X. It works the same way. It has that attitude thing. So this is, let's just talk about this channel strip real quick. So top left, these are the filters. If you want me to, if you're interested, let me know. I can talk about um, EQ next. You know, we've been talking about compressors for the last couple of days. We can talk about EQ later if you want, if you want to do that. Uh, these are the filters. This carves out all the lows. This carves out all the highs. Going down, this whole section here is uh, EQ. Uh, this is the high band, the high mids, low mid frequencies, and LF, low frequencies. And you can change the kind of curve, whether a bell curve or a shelf, I'm assuming, by by pressing these buttons we'll we'll cover compression i mean we'll cover eq later but here is the here's the money over here for these things to me this is the ratio this is the threshold and this is the release and this is a button for fast attack or a slower attack um so we talked about all that stuff yesterday and this is laid out differently and the ssl didn't think that you needed you know um uh, an attack um, potentiometer or to be constantly have to gain your attack just fast or slow, which makes sense. It makes sense. So, um, uh, and then going from here, this is a gate. Hardly ever use the gate on these things. Um, just not, not a fan. I just like more precise gating than this can do. Now, if you're, if you're mixing on a record and you don't have a ton of plugins and you've got this, it's the best gate in the world because it's the only gate you got, right? Um, I've got better gates in my plugin arsenal. And um, so that's what I use. Okay. Okay. So this uh, compression. Now, you remember I told you that he said, uh, trim it until you get 10 dB of, deep, of gain reduction. He didn't say turn down the threshold in, until you get it. He said turn down, uh, turn up the gain or trim it until you do. Uh, so on these SSL consoles, uh, especially in their day, you could recall everything about them, almost everything about them. And one of the things you could recall was this input gain or this trim coming from tape. And what Chris was telling me was basically leave your, th leave your threshold and your output at the same level all the time. And then if you want more gain reduction, put more level into it, right? Which reminds me of the 1176 yesterday. You remember that's the same approach we did yesterday with the 1176 has a fixed threshold. And what Chris was telling me to do is fix your threshold um, and then push the input up, which you would do that by here until you get 10 dB, which is that right there of gain reduction. So so the way I set this up, I call it, uh, John Wright helped me to name this. Uh, he called it the instant awesome preset because I've got a preset on this compressor or this channel strip that in my opinion, you put it up there. And if it opens with that, that, uh, uh, that preset on it, which is one that I kind of came up with, it just, the track sounds better. Boom. Next. Uh, it just, it just sounds better in my opinion. Now, sometimes I'll tweak it. Sometimes I don't. Um, and here's what I do. Okay. Here's the, here's what I do. I run the threshold all the way down to where, 
uh, nothing gets it. And then, oh, no, no, no. I turn the threshold all the way up so that it's minus 20. So that anything above minus 20 gets compressed, right? So I turn this threshold to here all the way up. And then I turn the ratio all the way down to one. So right now we're compressing everything at one to one, right? You remember yesterday we talked about um, how some people run things through a compressor just to hit the electronics that's inside the compressor. The compressor is not doing any work. It's just giving it character. This is one of those things. So I turn the threshold all the way up. Uh, I leave the, the, the attack time. Everything's about like this. Uh, and I turn the threshold all the way down to one. And then since I've got the threshold so low so that everything's being compressed at one to one, I just turn the ratio up until I get uh, about three to five or three to six uh, dB of compression. And it just sounds good. There's kind of like an auto makeup gain circuit into this that kind of makes up the gain as you compress it. It kind of pushes up the output gain, which makes a lot of sense. Kind of wish everybody would do that. I'm going to cover that in just a little bit. But anyway, it, try that. It's uh, It sounds really good if you have this. You don't have to have the waves. Um, it's the one I've used. And uh, um, Chris Crunk called me out. I think it was Chris Crunk called me out on it the other day. I don't know if he did or not, uh, on purpose or not, but talking about there's a lot of other SSL compressors, and they all sound good. And I may have to try some of them. Uh, so uh, let's see. Let's see. Okay, so that's the that's the SSL. And I'll I'll take some questions about that at the end. I'll leave that page up. Um, now I want to talk about another compressor. I don't use it as much as I used to. Uh, I'll tell you a little a little story about it. Let me let me switch pages here. And um, actually, I'm gonna stop that. Oop, I'm gonna. Sorry, forgive me while I um, uh, find another screen to share with you, okay? Let's see. We're going to use the this guy. Um, now, the Renaissance Vox compressor is one that I used to use a ton. I use it some now. Um, I've tried to use it in a live environment, uh, like at church, and it does so well at keeping levels levels pushed up that sometimes it causes a feedback problem. And so I'm not using it that much anymore, but in the studio, um, let me rewind just a little bit. So when I first built my studio, I bought a, um, a Yamaha O2R and the Yamaha O2R had this thing called a hip comp in it. And I don't know exactly what it did. Um, but this is the thing that reminds me of that the most. The hip comp on the SSL, I mean, on the uh, Yamaha O2R would, would I don't know, it just, there was some magic sauce on there, and I need to talk to Yamaha. I've got a buddy that works there. I need to talk to Yamaha about whatever happened of that because I used to put that on everything until I found the SSL. Um, the the hip comp, though, this reminds me of that. It just this just adds a little bit of um, a little bit of. Um, attitude. They changed the face of it a little bit. It's got a classic look that you can go back to and it looks like the same, but this is one of those things where you just, um, it's got a fixed, uh, I think this has got a fixed ratio or it may change the ratio depending on where your, um, where your threshold is. So this right here is a threshold. So, um, you pull this down and you get more compression. And the only thing I don't like about this is it doesn't do automatic the uh, makeup gain. So it gets louder as you pull this up. So your ear is deceived into thinking that it, it sounds better because it's louder. Your ear always will do that. Be on the lookout for that because um, your, your, the human ear will tell you that the louder thing is better. You can take a mix, the exact same mix and make a copy of it and make this one one dB louder. And people will always say there's something better about this mix and it's because it's louder. So, don't be deceived into thinking that what you're doing sounds better just because it's louder. I wish so. I wish this had a makeup game. There was a, there's a thing here called the, uh, well, well, we'll cover that in just a second. This does not have automatic makeup game, but it will give you, um, what I typically do is look at how many DB you're compressing. And then I'll pull this down by that same amount. So if you pull this down and you're getting, um, say, I don't know, 6 dB or 7 dB of gain reduction, which you'll see the little LED come down. 
as a, as the loud signals come in as the, you know, and this doesn't just work on this on vocals at bass. You could try it on bass. Um, when you see the thing come down three or four dB, just pull this down um, three or four dB because it's uh, it's it's increasing the gain of it. So just pull that down. Don't don't be deceived into that. So we won't spend too much time on this guy um, because I don't use it a ton anymore. Um, but I use uh, oh here's a uh, let me figure out how to do this. Uh, let me copy this. Here we go. I'm still not learning how to navigate all this. Uh, okay, here's an L2. This is an, uh, the Waves L2. Uh, this is a great guy for, um, I'll show you a trick on this one. It, it's not necessarily a trick. It's something that I do all the time. And it gets me away from thinking that my compressors are actually making things sound better and not just louder. Um, so on this one, it'll come out of the box with the threshold all the way up, the output ceiling all the way up, and it'll pretty much be like this on the, on the rest of it. And then you can pull the threshold down, and as you start compressing it, it will start, you'll start hearing it getting, getting louder. And again, I don't like that because when it gets louder, everything after that gets the brunt of that. Like let's say you've got an EQ after that, and then your, your input to your EQ just went way up, and you may be clipping it now, right? But hey, it sounds better. I mean, it's louder, right? So this this is a problem with this. So be careful. I'm going to show you a trick. You see this double arrow right here? If you push this all the way up and this all the way up too, that's how it comes out of the box when you instantiate it, unless you've got some kind of fancy, you know, a user setting thing that comes up that you've created. Well, let's just assume that you don't and you're using this uh, uh, like this for the first time. Grab this double arrow thing and pull it down because what it does is it pulls the threshold down and the output ceiling down uh, at the same time. So you'll you'll you won't hear any volume difference until you start hitting that compressor or that limiter. This is a is a limiter um, more more so than than anything. Well, it is a limiter. It's a brick wall limiter. It can be. And, and it can destroy your sound. Uh, but if you think it's louder is better, then you won't realize it's destroying. So number one thing that I see new mixers do is they push everything to the top. They make everything loud. And if everything loud, nobody knows what to listen to. And the thing about pushing everything loud is that you're more likely, if you're not on your game, you're more likely to distort things down the line um, and limit literally and figuratively what your mastering engineer can do or, or how your thing sounds. So um, take this advice on this ultra maximizer. I think the L3 does it too. Uh, the L1 does it too, has this double arrow, pull it down and you'll see, start to see um, attenuation here. That's the gain reduction. Um, you'll start to see that. And then if you close your eyes, you keep pulling it down. You start to actually hear what this thing is doing to it. And it's not pretty when you do too much of it. So be careful. Little advice there. Don't just yank this thing down, pull this down too, and listen. Use your ears and, and make sure that, you know, yes, you are limiting the dynamic range, but you don't want to kill. Um, you, you, can, you can limit your dynamic range without killing the dynamics of it. You know what I mean? You don't want it to sound like, um, you don't want it to sound with no personality, like it has no, like it, if I was talking just like this and I talk, you know, monotone and everything was exactly the same level, it would be kind of boring after a while. And the louder you make that, the more fatigued your ears get from hearing the same level all the time. So be careful with this and, and start to listen at what this thing is doing by pulling down this double arrow, uh, listen to it. And when you see it, when you hear it start to like affect how it sounds in a negative way, um, push it back up about halfway. That's what I do usually um, because I know I'm still getting a lot of mileage out of it. I mean, you'll look and you've got like 10 dB of, of uh, compression or 10 dB of limiting and you know, you don't hear it. That's good. And you're not hearing it louder either. So you've done every, you've done everything right. Then you, you haven't killed the sound of it. It still sounds pretty much the same and you've limited the dynamic range of it. So win, win, right? Okay. Okay. Um, so let's see, let me take a couple of questions 
And, uh, and then I'll move on to uh, something I use on every mix. As a matter of fact, I don't use, just use one. I use at least two on every mix that I do. And I'll, I'll reveal that. You may have already seen it. I don't know. Some of you may already know. Okay, so what's up, Gavin? What's up, Steven? Mark Jacoby is in the house. Um, let's see, Blake Bennett, good to see you, man. Um, the CLA Mix Hub version of SSL. I have not checked that out. I'll have to check that out. Um, you'll uh, have to give me some bullet points about what you like about it. Because um, I'm sure it's kind of customized a little bit. Maybe, I mean, it might be worth it just for the presets because I love uh, CLA as Chris Lord Algae. That's the, he is the man when it comes to that aggressive style mixing. He and his brother have been mixing for, oh gosh, so long. Um so, and he's so good. So, yeah, I'll, I'll check that out, Blake. I would love to know. Um, Isaac, you're welcome. I'm glad I could do it. Uh, and I hope that uh, hope you're learning something. Um, okay. I probably should read these questions before, because I, I, I just see a question and I pop it up there. Hopefully, I'll be able to answer it, right? Where do you typically use a limiter besides the two bus? Okay, so that's a great question, Gavin. Um I use one on the two bus, but I don't use, I use, um, I use an L2 on the limit on the two bus. Um, or I'll use a waves L I mean, a, and, um, a Massey L 2007. That is still a phenomenal compressor. If you haven't checked it, um, somebody can pop a link up there. If you, if you feel so inclined to, um, yeah, so I use the L 2007, or the L2 on the bus, and I, I don't even pull the threshold down. Um, I pull the output down so that it's like minus, I don't know, 0.5. So it never, it's a brick wall limiter. It never gets gets up above 0.5. The, in other words, it will never distort. But I don't move the threshold because I don't want it to shape the sound. I just want it to catch anything that might slip through. Um, and not destroy something. But before that is what you were asking. I, I think um, I'll show you what I use limiter wise on my, on my two bus in just a second. But suffice it to say that I put some kind of not, you were asking about a limiter. Um, I use compressors a lot. Uh, I use limiters um, some, well, a good bit. Um, so what I'll do is I usually put some, something on the drums to keep, because the drums are very transient. Um, when you, you know, the, the, uh, when people hit the snare, the attack of that snare is usually what is really loud. The body of the snare, um, is where you get that bigness, that, that girth that you love from big drums, right? It's not the attack. If it were the attack, everybody would win an award because it's not hard to get the snare drum to be as loud as possible. What you're trying to do again is to keep that, um, attack and the body of it, the tone of the snare, push together to where it sounds like a snare with good attack, but not too much. Have you ever had a drum that, that no matter how much you EQ'd, you never could get that. You never could get any body out of it. Usually it's because the attack of the snare is too loud and a limiter is good for helping you contain that. Uh, also parallel compression, which I saw your question mark and we're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, um, so I'll use it on the drums. Uh, I even use it on the, the, the band bus and the vocal bus. So I don't re the, I don't really limit my mix at the two bus. I always limit my mix before that. And it's a, it's something that I learned from a mastering engineer. Um, and it's been so valuable to me because, um, it, you just, it, you contain your mix a lot better. If you, if you have the choice of one limiter on the, on the very output or that same limiter on the band bus and the vocal buses, and you could compress them like, and tailor them to whatever you're going through them, then that's what I do. I always, I always do that. Um, so yeah, that's where I use them. Also, like I'll use a limiter also on anything that needs limiting. <laughs> Like for instance, we've talked about the bass player. You know, if you've got a bass player, it goes boom, 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 boom. You know, and you're trying to get those loud boom booms to match up with the soft boom booms, and then you uh, and you squeeze them together so that they're not so obviously different, right? 
So if a bass player is doing that, um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll take a, something like, I mean, not every time, but something like an L2, like what you're seeing on the screen right there, or a, way, a Massey 2007, which, by the way, is like $59. Crazy good deal. But it only works on Pro Tools. So there's that. Um, so if if the bass player is playing those notes, what I'll do is I'll cycle around where those loud notes are, and then I'll get a compressor or a limiter that will just take down those notes, right? Because that's that's the win, right? That's the that's the way you win when you like when you're using a compressor or a limiter the way it was designed to work. That's where you do it. So, um, Gavin, you were asking where I used it before the two bus bass players, um, snare drums. Um, even singers that are all over the place. Sometimes I'll use clip gain and pull them down. Sometimes I'll use a limiter on, on that part of the, like I'll just put a limiter. Uh, most of the time I clip gain it because I don't like the way I don't want to, I don't want to run the whole track through a compressor to save one thing. Right. I don't, or to limit one thing. Uh, I usually rethink that because I don't want it. I don't want it to shape it too much like that. Hope that answered your question, Gavin. It's a great question, man. Um, Let's see. Let's talk about just for a second. Mark asked a question about parallel compression. If you're not familiar, most of you guys are familiar with parallel compression. I learned about parallel compression and I have to say um, this. I don't want this to sound the way it, it's probably going to sound, but maybe if I tell you the backstory, um, you will um, you won't think I'm being facetious or anything like that. So when I worked in Asheville, North Carolina, I convinced those guys to let me come to Nashville and mix a record for a group called Karen Peck and New River. And it was, um, it was the record that Tony Rice played on. It had this old house on it. Um, and anyway, it was just a great record. And I said, Hey, what we need to do is go to Nashville and let uh, the big gun or heavyweight mix this. So um, there was a guy named Steve Marcantonio that was mixing and I convinced him to mix um, for a day on this record. It was 10 songs and he mixed one song a day. I squeezed two songs out of him, but man, what I learned on the, on that day. And one of the things I learned on that day was this crazy thing he was doing. Uh, I said, what, what are you doing right here? You're running the, the drums through a compressor and then returning it. It was like, yeah, that's, um, um, I forget what he called that. He, he called it, a, um, I forget what he called it, a sky hook or something like that, something crazy. I may be wrong. And if Steve, you, if you happen to watch this, I would love to talk to you more about this. Um, but he would, he would take a, the drums and he would run them through a compressor. And I think he ran it through like 1176 or something like that with all the buttons in, kind of like in your face. And he would return that like a reverb return. And this would have been like in 90, 94 and 95. And I was like, I have got to, I mean, that is a, that's a, that's the smartest thing I've ever heard, you know, to take the, all the, all the dynamic range of an original track, the way it was supposed to be played, but then add this stupid compressed track that doesn't sound good by itself, but add it to it. Then you've got all the transients of this track and all the sustain of this track. It's mind blown. Right. But he didn't only do that. Also, he took the piano and he ran it through, did the same thing, parallel, not compression, but parallel processing, I guess. He ran a piano through an, um, an Aphex Aural Exciter or a BBE Maximizer. I can't remember exactly what it was, but he took the piano and he got all the, uh, the, all the top end out of it and he added it back to the piano. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got to do this. So I started doing it when I got back and then, I don't know, it kind of took off. Uh, I d certainly didn't um, come up with it, but I feel like I was doing it um, back in 90, 94, 95, as soon as I found out about it. But anyway, so I, I don't want to say that I was doing it before everybody else, but uh, because obviously people were doing it and getting great sounds out. But now it's like it's almost like uh, so everybody does it now. But if you don't know what it, what it is, that's what it is. It's parallel compression is taking. Um, um, a super compressed signal and mixing it with the uncompressed signal and then kind of like, uh, you know, weaving it in every now in the last few years, um, compressors, plugins, especially, and even hardware needs to do this probably, but they have a, a mix 
knob. So you can turn it all the way to 100 percent. You get 100 percent um, compression. You can turn it half halfway, 50 percent, and you get 50 percent of the unprocessed and 50 percent of the really processed. So anyway, kicking. Um, yeah. So, Mark, sorry. Back to your question. Parallel compression on the kick and snare. Absolutely. I do that all the time. But what I usually do uh, and this is exactly what I do. Um, I create a track called Smack. And if you've ever seen any of my tutorials, you'll know that I always call it smack for some reason. Um, and then I'll run my kick and my snare and my toms through that. And then I'll just, and usually it's a, a DBX 160 and those just, they just sound good. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll push the line a little bit and make it because I know that I'm adding it back to the unprocessed signal. And um, so I, I always do kick and snare and toms and it adds a lot of body a lot of body to the, um, to the sound. So, um, uh, let's see. Isaac says, have you used the Oxford inflator? I have, I used to have the Oxford inflator somehow. And that, that's a remarkable, remarkable piece. And I, and it seems like I used it on, I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, when you get a new plug in and you use it on everything, um, I got it and I used it on everything. And I think even the, even the mix, uh, it was, it was great. I probably need to pick that up again. I don't remember how I got it, whether I, I used it as a trial or or whatever. Um, Brad Phillips, clip gain. Yeah. Um, clip gain um, is probably the most transparent form of compression you can use, right? If you, if you want it to sound more timeless and less trendy, and you don't want the compressor to um, to shape your sound too much, like in other words, if you're doing bluegrass or, um, jazz or orchestral, anything that would be like you can listen to in 30 years and go, and you don't want people to say, ah, oh, that was obviously mixed in 2010 because that was the trend. Uh, if you don't want that to happen, clip gain is your friend. And also if you've got a compressor set up, except for one line, that's just like wearing it out and you hear it, clip gain it down. Um, it's a great idea. Uh, so I'm with you, Brad. Um, clip gain is, uh, is great. Um, Let's see. Yep. Parallel compression is also New, New York compression. Guess who's from New York? Steve Marcantonio. So he may have been the inventor of it. I don't know. But I think he told me that he got it from somebody else, that somebody else was doing it. But I know it, he was all about it. And if you listen to any of those records that he did back in the, I mean, he was doing some killer stuff. He had just moved to Nashville from New York. Um. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if Chris, Mar uh, Steve Marcantonio was the guy doing that, but, um, anyway. Okay. So it looks like I've, I've gone through all the questions. If you got any more, I'll answer some more. I'll answer some more at the end. I'm talking way too fast. Maybe I, maybe I didn't need the first cup of coffee. I don't know. Okay. So I'm going to show you the, uh, limiter that I love to use all the time. And like I said, I'm going to do a long intro of this. Um, I went to a mastering engineer. I was mixing. Um, I was mixing a record just before I left Nashville, um, and I started using. Oh, I wish I could remember. I, I wish I could remember his name. Um, anyway, his name is John. Great mastering engineer. And uh, just a little caveat here: if you don't have a, ma if you don't, if you don't have a master, if, uh, how do I say this? Mastering engineers. Um, Build a relationship with a mastering engineer. They are a wealth of knowledge. Good mastering engineers are a wealth, a wealth of knowledge. And you should establish a relationship with a mastering engineer because if you just pass your stuff off to anybody that's mastering, a lot of mastering engineers just hate to say it. A lot of mastering en engineers are frustrated mixing engineers. Um, and what they'll do is they'll superimpose their opinion of what they thought your mix should be and how they could have done it better over the top of your mix. I've had that happen a lot. Uh, not a lot lately because I've established some relationships with some mastering engineers, right? Mastering engineers that go, okay, um, I get the vibe of where Kevin's going on this mix. I want to help him get there. Or best yet, this is the best reason to have a mastering engineer. They listen to finished records all the time. Get some, you know, insight from those guys. And, and I did. Um, John, we were listening to a mix and it's always humbling to listen to your mix on a, a set of like big PMCs or, you know, big mastering monitors. 
and I'm and and he was really working hard on a mix, and he said, "Let me show you something." And this is you know this is where you shut your mouth and you listen, right? He said, uh, and this is what I've been teaching for the last several years because it, it impacted me so much. He said, "Your kick and snare on this song sounds good. I like it. I'm not having to do much to it. I can pull up the level." On this one, he said, your, oh, what's the terminology? It's RMS. Um, I can't remember the terminology he used for it. But he said, your attack is way too high on these, on the snare drum and the kick here. And listen to what I have to do. <clears throat> listen to what I'm having to do to it and how much it changes the sound of your kick and snare. And I'm like, oh. And then when, when he masters it, um, it doesn't sound good. And he said, you should go back. And, and you should recall these songs and you should fix this about the kick and snare so that I can do what I'm doing better. Um, and I was, you know, took my hat off and like bowed my head and it was humbling, really humbling. But you know what? Uh, those lessons are hard fought lessons that take you a, will, will go with you for a long way. Right. This one did. Um, so, at that time, instead of using one limiter on the two bus, and I think, um, uh, Gavin, you were asking this question, and I'm going to dig a little deeper into this, okay? Instead of having one limiter on the two bus, why not? Um, I, I mix with, um, um, so I mix through buses. So I'll take all of my drums, I'll run them to a drum bus. And then I'll take all my guitars and I'll run them to a guitar bus. And I'll take all my keyboards, et cetera. And then I'll take all my instrument buses, my drums, my guitars, and I'll run them through a band bus. And then I'll tap off of that bus to get my, my, um, my, my uh, instrumental track. And then uh, so, so forth and so on. So what I started doing was I started limiting a little bit of drums right there so that I wouldn't get that much attack. And then I would limit a little bit of my um, band bus, right? So now the, the the drums are slowly being formed into place. And you don't, I don't, at least if it's changing the sound of my drums, I'm aware of it and I can fix it before it gets to mastering. So the trick is to get everything within 12 to 20 dB from the peak to the RMS or the, oh, what's an, I can't remember what, what the terminology is. And it's not the first time I've forgotten. Um, crest factor, crest factor. Thank you. Um, yeah. So he said your crest factor is too high or low or something like that. But anyway, that's what I did to fix it. And anybody that's mixing, uh, you should be thinking about that. You know, uh, you should at least listen to your mix one time through a, a limiter you know, that's doing too much work and see what the mastering engineer is going to have to deal with. Right. Um, best thing to do is just get a K 12 meter and, and it will tell you, it'll go up to zero when you're, when your RMS or your crest factor is good. Okay. Sorry. I've been talking a lot. Okay. I'm going to share, um, I'm going to share one more thing with you. I'm going to tell you what I went with that is, uh, the bomb, I think. And that is this guy. This slate, uh, FGX. Um, I used to use the ozone, and I still think ozone is great. It does a lot more than this, but man, does this ever this will this is a instant mix awesome Azure. And I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I do. The first thing I'll do is I'll take this constant gain monitoring and I'll turn it on. You know why? Cause I don't want to hear it get louder. I just want to hear what it's doing to the mix. Right. Um, let's see. So I will, I will take this uh, constant game monitor and turn it on. I'll turn the detail and the low punch up halfway as well as the dynamic perception. And I'll be honest with you. Um, uh, I, I, I hear little changes, but I'll, I'll tell you a way to, to find out exactly what it does. Turn this gain monitor on. Push this up until you're getting, this right here will tell you, see peak and RMS? You just want to make sure that this RMS is saying like minus 12. You don't want to go above that because you've got to leave room for, I found the sweet spot between like, is this mastering and this needs to be mastering is the K12. 
And if you get this at about minus 12, you leave room for mastering engineer and nobody th thinks your mix is uh, anemic. So uh, push this up until you get minus 12 here, or you see this, the RMS right here. The peak is always going to be up there. Peaks are really easy to get up to zero, right? Okay, and then once you get that turned on, and remember, if you turn on the constant gain monitoring, you don't hear what you're doing to it. I mean, you don't hear the loudness that you're adding to it. All you hear is what you're doing to it. So push this up. And when you start to close your eyes for a second and push the gain up and start listening and, and listen to when it starts to sound like crap. And you'll notice that you're up here. You're, it's way up here and you're killing your transients and it's not sounding good. So constant gain monitoring, turn all these up to 12 o'clock, push this up. I don't use this a whole lot even. I'm sure it's great. Um, and maybe I should use it more, but I don't hear it that much, to be honest with you. It's the most transparent compressor. And I usually just turn it up to like 1.5 to 1 and let it just let it play a little bit here. Minus 1 land, minus 2 land. And but this right here is where you're going to get a lot of uh, a lot of goodness from your mix because now you're you're getting in that in that range where your mastering engineer is not um, totally killing your mix, and you can tell what it sounds like. So this is uh, this is gold right here. And I would love to know if um, if you guys have found anything that you that you like. Um, so anyway, that's that. Hopefully, hopefully that was helpful to you. I know I would have loved to find out something like that. I'm going to take a couple more questions and I'm going to call it a morning. Um, let's see. Okay. I didn't read the whole question. Hopefully I can answer this. How do you convince the clients to invest in the mastering process as opposed to just asking you to do it? I hate having to master my own mixes. I do too. And that's why I master my mixes as I go. Um, so what I'll say, what I usually convince people, you know what, Daniel, Here's the deal. What would you rather have? Um, would you rather have? Um, would you rather have somebody that they picked master your mix, or would you rather just master it yourself? That's kind of a that's a that's an easy slam dunk answer. I know what my answer has always been. So I frame it in in such a way that um, that I mean, hopefully this will help you. Um, you can't really put a price on a good mastering engineer because there's good mastering engineers that, that don't charge a lot of money. There's bad mastering engineers that charge a lot of money. Um, that's why you should build a relationship with a guy and you can tell them, Hey, um, and, and maybe a little reverse psychology here. It's like, you can tell people that you don't want to be anybody mastering your mix except for this guy. And he's this much person. And maybe he cuts you a rate, uh, a deal or whatever. And that's fine. Um, but if you, you know, if you, you know, if you mix in that K12 range, they're not going to be able to change it. Well, mastering engineers can change it a lot. But how do you convince him to to go with the mastering process? Um, build a relationship with a mastering engineer and say, here's what you do. This is this is the this is the way to do it. Get your guy like um, like I've got um, a relationship with with three mastering engineers, and you can say, hey, um, mastering buddy. Um, I've got a client that is not convinced that they need to master something and didn't know if you would be interested in this, but would you be interested in mastering one song and let me hear it and let them hear it? And then they can make up their mind whether they want it mastered by you or not. And that's putting it all on the line because, you know, egos are, egos are at stake here. Right. Um, and so take your, take your, and most mastering engineers, including John that I was talking about in Nashville, mastered the first song for free. Um, just because they're convinced if, if they're good mastering engineers, they can improve your song or they can improve you, which is, which is best too. Um, so, you know, Daniel, find your mastering engineer that you like and you say, Hey, I don't want anybody mastering the mix, but maybe these three guys. Um, and so if, if, uh, if you're not going to choose one of those guys, um, then I'm fine mastering my own thing. All right. You need to go there. And then you say, but, if you want it, um, I've got a, a relationship with a mastering engineer and I would love for you to hear the difference that it can make. And I would like to hear the difference it can make. And if you don't mind, we can send one song. And they said they'd do the first song because nobody wants one song mastered unless it's a single, right? If you're talking about a 10 song record, they're not going to want that one song mastered. They're either going to go all in or get out, right? Um, so send it to the mastering guy and say, hey, you know, 
whether or not you get to write it, whether or not you get to uh, master the whole record or not depends on, you know, if they like your mastering job. Now, be careful setting that up because they'll, what I call go for the Grammy and they'll, and they'll make it so loud and they'll just go over the top. I've done it before. I've heard other people do it before. Um, so be careful how you set that up, but then let them hear it say, okay, Hey, this is uh this is my mix. You like it? Yeah, it's good. Everybody's bobbing their head. Yeah, it sounds good. Here's the mastering um, job uh, and, and make sure, try to make sure they're at the same level because again, they can make it louder. They can take it from K12 to K2 and, you know, they can do it in a diplomatic way that has no dynamic range, but they're always going to, your client's going to probably consider the louder one, the better one. Try to make sure that doesn't happen. Just, you know, match up the level and say, this is my mix. This is the master. And then you'll, you'll really, they will know, you will know, your mastering engineer will know that's the best way to do it. So that's my advice on that. Um, let me know if that was a, if that was a answered your question, Isaac Moranius, do I have presets? I don't have, I mean, yes, I have tons of presets. I use uh, presets out of the box sometimes too. I'll tweak them up a little bit, but yeah, I have go-to stuff. And as a matter of fact, the SSL instant awesome preset that I have, it's available somewhere. Um, you know what? Um, I have it somewhere, but I, um, I, I don't know how to get it to you exactly, but yeah, um, I do have that. Uh, otherwise I don't have any presets that I could give you, but I use presets all the time. When I find something that I like, like verbs or, um, compressors or something like that, a good starting place, I'll save it. And I'll say, Kevin's awesome. Um, I don't, I don't name everything. Awesome. John named that awesome. Kevin's, uh, um, ballad snare drum or uh, fast snare or, or something like that. So do that. I don't have any presets that I could, except for the instant awesome thing, though. No. Gavin says, that was awesome. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad you liked it. Good stuff. Daniel Howell, thank you, man. Uh, I'll take, let me take one more, um, let me take one more question because I've been chatting for an hour and my voice is telling me that, right? Um, oh, thanks. Um, wrong one. Isaac, when you're talking about the your buses, where do you route your verbs and delay? Vocal verb, vocal delay into vocal bus and instrument, yes, uh, or instrument, or do you have separate buses straight to mix? No, I, um, and the reason I, I bus all the, everything pertaining to vocals to the vocal bus, um, if it's background vocal verb, I'll put it through the background vocals and then send that to the vocal bus, right? Um, I, and I do that because I not only mix through buses for those reasons to kind of like stair step my dynamic range down, which is something I probably need to uh, coin the phrase on that, but you're stair stepping your dynamic range down, right? Where it's not that noticeable. But the other thing I do, which I think is, I think is smart because um, you know, for the longest time you couldn't bounce faster than real time out of pro tools. And I would be doing these big orchestral ballads and stuff where the, where you would not only need a mix, an instrumental track, a TV track, that's with no lead vocal, but you'd also need a split track with the vocals on the left or the band on the left, vocals on the right. You'd need one with a click on the left and the band on the right. Then you'd need a soprano and then alto, and then you'd need a ton of stems. And so I just, I, I started tapping off of those buses to create other mixes. And um, so that's why I put the, those verbs in those buses so that it'll be contained. Um, it might sound better if I didn't process them at all. I'm not sure. Um, but I know that, you know, as you stair step stuff down, now you're when you're listening to the two mix or the, the mix, then you know what you're getting, right? Uh, you're not surprised by anything. So Daniel Howard said, answered beautifully. Thank you. Um, do you use the same monitors to mix and master? You're talking about when I do it myself? Uh, yeah, I use the same four sets of monitors for all of that stuff. I use my car, which is probably one of my preferred monitors because I can drive them around, right? Um, I use my Barefoot MM27 Gen 2s. I think they're great. Uh, I use my NS10s. I use I use Bose Quiet Comfort headphones sometimes. I use Grado headphones. I use earbuds. I use um uh, Yamaha RHM 5As. And uh, there, there is a, this is a perfect place to say this. So uh, um, there's a course that I've created, if you guys are interested in it. And I talk about triangulating a mix. Okay. If you're listening to one set of monitors for both 
you're getting one person's story. And how many, like if you're trying to get to the bottom of something, something's happened in your life and there's like five or six people and they all have different stories. Don't you go to each one of those people and you find out what their take of the story is and you go, okay, that's Kaylin. Uh, she's going to tell me from a nine-year-old perspective, this is my wife. She's going to tell it to me this way. And not that I've ever done this particular example, but Columbo is what I compare it to. So he, he would, in, he would ask everybody and then he would put together the truth from what every, everybody else's version of the truth was that we, that's what you should be doing with your, with your mixes. Every one of them. Don't be surprised by a mix because if you um, if you are, it's because you haven't listened to enough stories, right? I cover all of this and more, so much more in this uh, thing on mixcoach.com. Uh, it's called, I think it's called Better Mixes, Improve Your Mixes Overnight. So click on that. And within just a couple of minutes, you'll be hearing this story here. And um, so check it out. So to answer your question, I'm going to go back and I'm going to leave that up. Um, to answer your questions, yes, I listen to the same monitors uh, for mixing and mastering. And it's the same five or six set of monitors. Okay. Um, and if I ever get a chance to listen somewhere else, then I just compare what that is to what monitors I have and which, which one tells me that kind of similar story. Okay. So man, that flew by. It's been almost an hour and I've been just yapping about compressors and who knew I did this yesterday too. Okay, Mark. Yeah, I've got to hear speakerphone. I think that's a that's a Altiverb put out a thing called speakerphone, and you can emulate all of these different speakers through one plugin. You can run it through your two mix. At least this is my the what I want to do with it. This is designed for sound design for movies and stuff. Like if you got somebody talking on an iPhone and you but you actually sung it through a, a, a condenser mic or a really good sounding mic. This is like you know you take it from a U forty seven to a iPhone seven. Um, it'll allow, allow you to do that. And I was mentioning to Mark the other day, how cool it would be to be able to, um, to listen to those mixes in real time. Just go, let's see, there's a Honda Odyssey. There's a Honda element. This is a Lamborghini. Cause I'll never hear the sound system in one of those. Uh, this is an iPhone. This is whatever. And you, if you can triangulate what you're talking about, um, or what you're going to hear, that'd be a win. So anyway, Mark Jacoby, uh, uh, you'll have to tell me how that is. Um, Greg Fox. I'll take that. <laughs> Good to see you, man. Um, okay. That's it. Uh, I'm going to, uh, drop it right there and we'll come back tomorrow. Hey, I've got, I just secured, um, a pretty cool dude, um, for the show on let's see. I think it's uh, Thursday. We're going to be talking to Scott Williamson. Scott Williamson is a, this is not tomorrow now, it's the next day, okay? I'm going to be talking to Scott Williamson, who is a drummer. He talks like John Wayne to me. I always, I'm always remind him, you know, his talk and his, his, uh, his voice always reminded me of John Wayne. So I think of John Wayne when I hear um, Scott Williamson. But anyway, Scott's a killer drummer, jazz drummer, producer, songwriter, I think. From California, moved to Cal uh, moved to Nashville, and great session guy, uh, incredible. And uh, and now he started mixing, and he's doing some incredible mixing too. So I'm gonna find out what he's doing. So uh, if you want to uh, if you want to check that out, uh, I've already got. Uh, I will rename the broadcast. Go to uh, let's see, where can you go? You can go and you can. Uh, well, you know what? Just subscribe to the channel, right? Hit subscribe. Hit the bell button, and that way you'll be notified when I go live. And I will put uh, which podcast or which um, which broadcast that Scott's going to be on. But it's going to be it's going to be some good stuff. And I know uh, some of my mixing guys in Nashville are wanting to know what what um, what Scott's doing because he's doing some really good sounding mixes. Okay. Uh, so anyway, okay. Mark says enjoy your day off. I am going to be off the rest of the day. I hope so. Anyway, it's good hanging out with you guys. Thank you for coming every week, and uh, thank you for the kind comments, and thank you for the awesome questions, and I hope this helps you in some way, okay? So until we meet again, which is tomorrow at 8, um, I will see you on the next broadcast, okay? Take care. <laughs>